because it fills a void in my life by the sermon, through the songs, and through the fellowship with other Christians. Because uh, Jesus saved my life and I'm here to praise him. To be fed, we love the ministry here. Because I love worshiping God through song. Because the community feels like family. Because of the friendships we've formed here and because we are called to fellowship with other believers. Because you learn about Jesus. To have my God-shaped hole filled so I can be a blessing to others throughout the week. To grow my relationship with Jesus Christ more. I love to hear, hear the pastors talk about their favorite foods that they enjoy, but I love the spiritual food that they think best. Because I like to learn about Jesus. Because I find love, joy, and peace there, enabling me to go forth and share hope with others. Because life is hard some weeks, and this is a place of renewing for me and my boys. To engage a community of fellowship. I learned about Jesus. To be surrounded by champions of Christ and to worship alongside fellow believers. To feed my soul. Because it's a great way to meet new Christian friends around my age. I get peace, joy. Because I want to be with a people that believe in Jesus as I do. To learn about Jesus. For encouragement, to learn more about God, and to serve. To worship with a great community. I absolutely love the fellowship and the coffee. For accountability and for fellowship and to set a good example for our children. Because of the fellowship. Because I get to hang out with friends and it's just a good time overall. Community, fellowship, encourage, and to be encouraged. At the end of a long week, I just need to be in God's house. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, by the way, to all of those that helped to make that uh, video possible, those of you that were interviewed, as well as those who put that together that took some, some time this week. And we appreciate that. Show them some love this morning for that, would you please? Well, good morning. It is good to see each of you this morning. So glad that you're here. It's, uh, it's a day the Lord has made, and we're to rejoice and to be glad in it. And I'm excited this morning about the opportunity to talk to you about our topic today of church attendance, becoming involved, and serving as a church family. Special welcome, by the way, to uh, the Palmerton campus today. We're so glad that you're here. Would you show them some love this morning? <laughs> welcome those on each campus as well, if you would, please. Facebook, YouTube, from the website. Thank you. Thank you for being here. So I, I heard about a little girl that... Um, Loved church. She loved going to church. She was in a small community and just uh, within walking distance of the church. Her parents didn't go to church, but she did. She loved Jesus. She loved the church. She loved Sunday school. And she liked hearing the stories about Jesus. And so anyway, she would walk to church each Sunday. It wasn't that far, but it was three or four blocks. Anyway, she was walking this one Sunday and, and she had gotten a slow start. And so she was not wanting to be late for Sunday school. And so she she was praying on the way. She said, Lord, help me not to be late. Lord, help me not to be late. And about that time, a big gust of wind caught her from behind, and she almost fell. And she looked up immediately and said, Jesus, don't push me. I just don't want to be late. <laughs> Leadership Magazine uh, has some great cartoons in it. Uh, it has in the past. And, and a lot of us smiled when we, when we saw this cartoon of a pastor as he was preaching and all of a sudden, the, the usher gave him uh, something to read. And so he, he, read this, he read this to the congregation. We interrupt this sermon to inform you that the fourth grade boys' class are now completely in control of their class, and they're holding Miss Mosley hostage. <laughs> well, apparently, Miss Mosley was there to teach, and the fourth grade boys, they had other plans for the morning. My question to you is, why do you go to church? Why do you go to church? It might be for the dynamic preaching. Pastor Kevin does an awesome job. There's no question about that. He's a highly gifted person. Ind ind individuals talk to me different times about that's one of the reasons they come to Bethany to hear him preach. And I, I totally agree. Now, we have a large staff, so I'm not going to go any further into the pastoral staff, but we have a lot of gifted people. But, but possibly, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. But, but the truth of the matter is, it, some people come for that. Some people come for, for the, the musical team. Pastor, I mean, Anthony does a fantastic job with that. He really, really does. Our team up here, our tech team, it, it, it's, you know, you, you, you go to other places occasionally and you just realize what you have. That's all. Sometimes you realize what you have at that particular point. 
Maybe you come together for the community. Maybe that's what it is. You enjoy this fellowship that we share together. Maybe that's why you come. Maybe, as one of the gentlemen said in the video, you come because some weeks are really tough. They are for all of us, aren't they? Some weeks are more challenging than others, but some are quite challenging, to be honest about it. But I would just ask you this morning, what if, what if, what if you're coming to church wasn't just about you? What if it wasn't? What, what if your coming to church wasn't just for you? you? You realize that by you making the decision to come, you encourage other people to come. Do you realize that? You really do. You really do. If you would get up one morning and say, you know, I just don't feel like going. Probably the other people in your household would say, Oh, okay, good. We won't go. You have an influence other other people when you talk during the week. Hey, by the way, I'll see you on Sunday. You have that influence in their lives. It's true that we all can put forth an effort, not just for ourselves, not just for God, who is the object of our worship. I've on a couple of occasions heard someone say, I didn't particularly like that song. And I felt like saying, well, good because it wasn't for you. It was for Jesus. We live in a world that is very, very me-centered. We need to think how to motivate others, how to motivate others. There's, there's a lot of folks who really don't spend a lot of time thinking about God or considering God or how they can help other individuals. But God reminds us throughout Scripture that we have an obligation or we have a responsibility to help others. The author of Hebrews introduces this concept that some have not considered. When he says in verse 24, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and of good works. I served on a board a number of years ago when I was at a congregation and I was the lead pastor at that time. And there was a gentleman on that board, his name was Keith. And Keith really enjoyed seeing the kingdom of God grow. He loved to see people come to know Christ as their Savior. And so once in a while, something would come up that we needed extra money for a particular minister or whatever, and I would just make the, the board aware of that. And quite often, Keith would say, you know what, Pastor? I'm going to give $500 to that. I'll give $1,000 to that. How about the rest of you? And this one would chirp up, and this one, and quite often before the end of the meeting, why, the entire need was met. And then after the meeting, private least, Keith would come up to me and he would say, uh, by the way, Pastor, uh, I'll go ahead and just make out a check for the whole amount, and the rest of the money that comes in, use that for wherever we need it in the church. Keith loved, loved the church, and he loved to motivate other people to give to God's kingdom. He loved to see the kingdom expand. Bethany Wesleyan Church is a family of faith. It's a, it's a community of believers. There are so many different ways that you can serve in our church community, all kinds of them. Peggy and I were talking this last week, and do you realize for this service this morning, for the 1045 service and for Sunday school, it takes 140 volunteers? 140 volunteers. Some of you really enjoyed that service on the hill last Sunday night. 350 people were there, by the way. We had 40-some people volunteering to make that happen. It, all, it just all takes volunteers. Vacation Bible School is coming up. You heard about that. You might want to get involved in assisting with Vacation Bible School. There's all kinds of ways to do that. Soviet sports parachutist, uh, parachutist Yuri Yablinklo had trouble, as I had trouble with his name. <clears throat> he realized he was really in trouble at about 3,000 feet before he hit the ground because his main chute didn't deploy. The secondary chute didn't deploy either. He had some fellow parachutists that were down below, and so he yelled to them. And they went to the truck, and they got this, this big mat, this, this big mat that was in the back of the truck, and they tried to position themselves so that they would be under him. He was trying all kinds of things to help the chute to come untangled, but it didn't, all to no avail. And so finally, as he was coming down, he, he knew he was, about, he was about to have impact. 
And when he hit that mat, they were all holding it very, very tightly. When he hit it, the force of it caused each of them to fall back and they let go of the mat. And when the dust cleared, our dear brother had rolled, I mean, just came to a, to a complete stop. They looked at him, he lost his breath for a moment. He ended up with a bruised ankle and with some bruises later on out of that kind of a fall. But you know what? Yuri's, Yuri's friends were there just when he needed them. They were there and they, they assisted him. And that's what God wants us to do as a church family. God wants us to help those within the church family as well as to reach out to those outside the church family as well. Think about your need of others. Think about your need of others. The writer of Hebrews continues, verse 25, and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. I, I chose that this would be taken from the New Living Translation. I know it from the NIV, but this is from the, the New Living Translation. I like the wording of it. Let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Tony Evans is a great Baptist pastor and author, and he wrote this and when it comes to this whole idea of, of church family and community. He said, many Christians today are spiritual orphans, children of God with no family relationship. Think about that. Others are like foster children, bouncing from house to house and never finding a home. And then he said, it just doesn't take five years to find a church home. And I would agree with that. I would agree with that. We all know that, that babies grow best uh, in a home environment. And when children are orphaned or when, when there's an unsuitable home that a child simply cannot be raised there for whatever reason, it's good to get those children into a healthy family home. It's good to do that. And I would just say to you this morning, if you're a disconnected believer here today and you don't have a church home, let me just simply say, friend, you, you're living way underneath where you should be. God does not intend us to live like that. He wants us to be connected. He wants us to share community with other people. I heard about a guy that uh, went to church, oh, once or twice a year, something like that. His wife went all the time. But he was complaining about the church. <clears throat> You've never met anyone that's complained about the church, have you? No, uh-uh complaining about the pastor. He said, you know, I'd go more often, but the truth of the matter is every time I go to church, all he talks about is either Jesus' death and resurrection or his birth. She said, honey, you only go on Christmas and Easter. <laughs> when Hebrews 10.25 was written, they were having Christians that were not attending worship services. There was some persecution that was happening that particular time and some of the people just simply didn't want to be caught up in the persecution. They didn't want to be looked down upon because of being believers. They didn't want to face any kind of suffering. They certainly didn't want to go to jail if, if it was the case as well. The writer was also writing here to basically Jewish Christians. They were Jews who embraced Jesus Christ as their Messiah. They realized that he was the Messiah, and so they embraced him as their Messiah and they left the Jewish laws and all, the, all of the, the things that they were, ceremonies that they were involved in. They weren't a part of that anymore. And, and then when the persecution came, some of them said, maybe we'll go back to Judaism. And so he was encouraging them, don't, don't go back. Don't go back. You know, God will never abandon you. Don't abandon him. So... What stops you from coming to church? We have a nice size congregation here right now, so you have no idea who it was. I was out in the lobby talking to someone. I said, that's really good to see you. I said, are you, are you back for the first time? They said, no. We, we came a couple of times, the husband said, and then the wife said, and then we got lazy. Oh. Oh. It's easy to do that. There were people back then that got lazy, too. And some of you have confessed that to me. Some of you have said, you know what, I've just been lazy, that's all. 
Well, let me encourage you. Let me encourage you to keep coming to church. Keep coming to church. We all need regular worship. Each and every one of us do. Each and every one of us do. You know, when you leave this church on a Sunday and you go out and you start your vehicle and you either drive home or you drive and get some brunch or lunch or breakfast or whatever you do, when that happens to you, you happen to lose some of the gasoline that you came with because it just takes gasoline to go somewhere. And it doesn't take a terrible person to make a gas tank go from full to empty. All you got to do is just drive around. That's all you have to do. And I would simply say that after being here, if you don't feel encouraged, if you don't feel encouraged, if you don't feel uplifted, if you don't feel so very, very thankful for a church family like this, if, you, if, if through the singing of the praises to God, at, at, through the reading and the hearing of God's word and the, the expounding on God's word as well, the, the chance for community together, if you don't feel better about that, if your tank isn't full, something may be wrong with you. Because you generally do. Amen? Yeah. Amen. But you know what? Within four or five or six hours, it starts to deplete a little bit. It does. You know why? Because life happens. Life happens. And it's just a normal process. And just like you need to take your vehicle on a regular occurrence to the gas station to get filled up and to make sure everything's okay, so as a believer, as a believer, you need to come to church on a regular basis so that God's word can speak to you, so that you can be encouraged by the family of God, so that you can have an opportunity to be a part of an of a important community, to have that spiritual tank filled. You need that. Hebrews 10.25 points out what Christians should do when it simply says there in verse 25, encourage one another. Encourage one another. Tell, tell your neighbor this morning, encourage one another. Just tell them. Encourage one another. Tell them. Tell the one on the other side, encourage one another. Go ahead, tell them. I'm giving you a chance to talk. You should take it. <laughs> yes, it's true. We all need to encourage one another. One of the biggest, highest human duties in life is to encourage people. It's easy to laugh at men's ideals. It's easy to just pour cold water on things that people are going to try. It's easy to do that. The world is full of discouragers. It really is. It's full of discouragers. We have a Christian duty to encourage one another. Many a time, just a word of praise or a word of appreciation, a word of thanks or cheer can make the difference between a, a mother, a young mother, between a senior adult, between a teenager in the church, feeling like, you know what, I can make it. I'm going to make it. Think about the one thing that we all need, verse 25. The one thing that we all need. Chuck Swindoll said this, the lack of encouragement is almost an epidemic. He said, I firmly believe that an individual is more Christ-like than when he is full of compassion for those who are down, needy, discouraged, or forgotten. How terribly essential it is that our commitment to encouragement, encouragement, it's a new watch word for our time. Shout it out. Pass it around. John Maxwell happens to be a Wesleyan pastor. He's also a leadership guru for many, many companies and organizations throughout the United States. John Maxwell was asked the question, how do you know whether or not someone needs encouragement? Maxwell said, if they're breathing, if they're breathing, we all need encouragement. Tell the person beside you, if they're not sleeping, tell them, I need encouragement. Go ahead, tell them. Just, I need encouragement. You speak back to them and say, you look, you look like you do. Go ahead, just tell them, you look like you, you look like you do. Maxwell also said, by the way, <clears throat> he also said that um, encouragement is like oxygen for the soul. I love that. Encouragement is like oxygen for the soul. It takes very little to give it, but a huge return when you do. So I want my friend uh, Brandon Abarca to come up here real quick, if you would please, sir. Welcome in, by the way. So this is Brandon, Brandon Abarca. Uh, he, was, he, he serves on the praise team sometimes. 
He's involved in the young adult, adult group. Uh, he's one of the sponsors for the student ministry. Uh, he works around the church campus some. And it's, it's, it's not unusual at all that he'll come to me, up to me on a Monday or Tuesday and say, by the way, I met a new family this week. By the way, I met some teenagers this week that I didn't know before. By the way, that guy's name is so-and-so. If Brandon hasn't spoken to you yet, he will. Just give him time. He will. He is a perpetual encourager. He really does that extremely well. Thanks for making Jesus look good through the church family. Thank you, man. Lord bless you. Lord bless you. So when I was a teenager, I was a typical teenager. <clears throat> I actually, I actually had it really going on as a teenager. I really did. I just, I just got to be honest with you. I really had. I was, uh, I was extremely handsome. <clears throat> I had a full head of hair. <laughs> I did. None of it coming out of my ears at all. Isn't that, why does that happen? Anyway. <laughs> full head of hair. Yeah. But, I mean, I already knew that I was supposed to be a pastor. I knew that at that time. God had called me to do that. But still, I had some times that I needed someone to speak into my life. And Esther Bailey was one of those that did. She was my Sunday school teacher at the time. I can't really tell you anything Esther said. I can't really tell you if she was a good teacher or not. But I can tell you this. Esther would talk to me, would encourage me, I knew that Esther prayed for me. And I really liked Esther. She was a neat lady. It was very helpful for me at that time in my life. At that particular time, there weren't a lot of churches that had youth pastors. But that was okay, because we had Gene Liggett. We had Gene Liggett. Gene Liggett was just this, I mean... Be like uh, Brandon there on speed. I mean, she, <laughs> she was just incredible. Jean and Lloyd had five sons of their own. Now, that's a good start to a youth group right there. I don't care what anyone says. I mean, that's it. that'll get things happening right there. But we had a really a nice size youth group, and um, Jean was an encourager through and through. I was in a teen trio from our church, uh, Lynette Moyer. And uh, Daryl Heisler and myself, the three of us, we went out and we, we sang at the church. We sang at various other churches, other events, that sort of thing. And we went to other states, actually. And come to think of it, we were actually internationally known. We, really, we, we sang at a church in Canada one time. But anyway, <laughs> but, but Jean, Jean really, really encouraged us as a trio. And she probably... She probably stretched the truth sometime, but we let her. We let her stretch the truth, tell us we were better than we actually were. We let her do that. Felt good. But Jean was just one of those people. She was one of those people that everyone needs to have in their life. And at that particular time, there were um, several men in the church that made a difference in my life, but one of them was George Vogel. George Vogel. And um, George would come up to me and talk to me as a teenager, and he'd ask me what's going on and stuff, and uh, he also would laugh with me. And that was a weird time back then, because there were people that didn't know you could even smile and be a Christian back then. I mean, it was just, it was weird. It was just kind of strange. But, but, but he laughed. He really enjoyed laughter. He really did. And so Esther and Jean and George really made a difference in my life. I don't know that they ever knew that, but they did. They really did. Did you notice the way that the writer ends verse 25? Did you notice that? Let's look at it again. Verse 25. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. 
especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. I like the way that the message translates this particular verse as well. It says, let's see how innovative we can be in encouraging love and helping out, not avoiding worshiping together as some do, but spurring each other on, especially as we see the big day approaching. So as, especially as we see the big day. What's he talking about? He's talking about his return and the big day. What's he talking about there? He's talking about the rapture. He's talking about when Jesus Christ comes again. Now, I, I know that, as I said before, yeah, the, the Jewish people, some of them had given up on the fact that Messiah would ever come. But Jesus did come. He was the Messiah. And some people have kind of given up on the idea that Jesus is going to come again, but he will come. He will come. No question about it. The Bible says that the dead in Christ shall rise first. That's not, that's not any particular denomination he's talking about there, but he says the dead in Christ, the dead in Christ will rise first, and then the, we that are still alive and remain shall be caught up to be with the Lord in the air and will be forever with the Lord. Yes, that's what he's saying, and it, there's, the Bible also makes it very clear that there will be persecution coming to believers during that time. And you may feel like you're being persecuted right now, but let me just simply tell you, according to a lot of the world's standards, you're not. You're not. There's a whole lot of countries that a lot of persecution is happening, and people lose their lives. But as that day approaches, it'll be tougher, and we'll need to encourage one another. We'll need to do that. It's going to be important. So how do we wrap up this sermon? Well, I want to ask you a couple of questions. Who's, who are some people that encouraged you? Who are some folks that encouraged you in your life? Have you ever told them? If they're so alive, you might want to do that. Might be a good thing to do. Number two. So who are you encouraging right now? Who are you encouraging? Who are you specifically going out of your way to encourage them. And thirdly, and probably most importantly, who should you be encouraging? Who should you be encouraging? Think about those around you. Think about those in your web of influence. God calls us to be encouragers for the kingdom. Let's make sure we do that. Let's pray. So, Father, thank you for this time together today. Thank you for folks that truly are encouragers and really very, very helpful. I pray, Father, that you'll help each of us to take on that responsibility. Help us to seek out people that we can encourage, people that we can help. Through a word, through simply a, a, an action that we can take that would really, really encourage their hearts. Help us, Father, to realize the importance of, of our coming together to worship you. We love this time. Help us not to give in to laziness. Help us not to be concerned about what others might think. But help us to come to truly worship the God of our salvation. We love you and we pray your blessing on your people today in Christ's name. Amen.